and welcome to On Geopolitics, this podcast from the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge with Professor Ali Ansari and me, Suzanne Rain. Today, we're going to talk about heroic leadership and whether it's a good thing or not. And we're joined in that conversation by retired Air Marshal Ed Stringer, who until 2021 ran the UK's Defence Academy and before that ran the operations in the UK's Ministry of Defence. Ed's now uh, with me, a trustee at the Imperial War Museum and a fellow of Policy Exchange. Ed, this is an enormous subject. We're looking at the world and we're seeing examples of heroic leadership at the moment. And we're also seeing examples of arguably not so heroic leadership. And I suppose the first question, well, the first question is how do you define it? But then my question is, do we want more of it or less of it? Well, Suzanne, first of all, thank you for having me on. And could I just say right up front, what I'm, I'm really pleased about this format of having a podcast because we can discuss it. There aren't absolutes. It's not black and white. And almost everything I say here would be contested and you could provide an example for and again. So we're talking about trends and we're talking about a behavior that becomes inculcated. And the reason I'm interested in it is because as a student of the Defence Academy going back decades, I was fed this stuff on heroic leadership and I believed it. And it's only as I've gone further and further up the promotion ladder, if you like, and then looked at the real world outcomes, and I've started to question it. And the reason I lay it in front of you today... Can I just... I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, Ed, just to say, when you say I was fed this stuff about heroic leadership, what were you fed? (laughs) What's the line on heroic leadership? If you want me to define, and it isn't defined uh, Mm. anywhere particularly, though you have to go back and look at what's taught and what's measured, because that's what you get. And I'll define it as where... The ability to be successful on military campaigns is centred absolutely on the general. I'm using that in a generic sense, the general officer, who has an intuitive ability to sense, to come up with an amazingly creative, genius-like solution and energy and will to drive it through. So the ability of the whole to be successful is centred very much on the intuition, character and will of a single individual. And of course, up until very recently, that was always a man. And I could, and you won't have time, I could go through all the various lectures we have on leadership. And I've just been checking that they're teaching this on the RAF division at the moment, uh, though it's essentially an an army paper. And it uses phrases like genius. It uses phrases I could quote to you from T.E. Lawrence. There's a romantic heroic figure, T.E. Lawrence, about kingfisher moments where nine tenths can be taught, but there's a thing they call the irrational tenth. And that irrational tenth is like a a flash of a kingfisher's wings as it skims across a flash of brilliance, a flash of genius. And this flash can either be in cutting through the fog of war, seeing what no one else on the battlefield can see and intuiting it, and then having a moment of genius, a moment of brilliance that gives you, think of historical parallels, you know, the can I moment, 216 BC, the envelopment on the battlefield and a great and triumphant victory. And these things are taught And they're very seductive and they're very appealing to young and ambitious military officers who are told you're on the path to reveal your military genius and you too can be a Hannibal, you can be a Marlborough, you can be a Napoleon and so on. So that's what's taught. I followed that through. And as I got to some of the more senior positions and look at some of the failings across defence, operational and in peacetime, I think part of the problem is we load people up to show great skills of heroic leadership and those can lead to some suboptimal, unfortunate outcomes in the real world. It's, it's sort of, um, it, it, the way you're saying it, Ed, is it's like that uh, you're heaping an expectation on people who may not be able to, in some ways, live up to that expectation. I mean, I find it quite odd that people think that they can almost teach genius or they can cultivate genius. I mean, presumably that's, in a sense, what we're trying to do in some ways, is trying to bring out the instinctive or the, uh, I don't know, the, the slightly esoteric ability to sort of, I suppose, read a situation. But then to be able to read a situation, I would say really well, requires you to be able to absorb, digest, and engage with information on a, on a very rapid scale. So, I mean, it depends on what you describe or what we would understand by the term genius. And I think I agree from what you're saying in a sense that there's an element where perhaps we're teaching genius as something almost, you know, as I said, you know, esoteric, something inner <laughs> that you can't really explain. But the minute you do that, you are perhaps leading yourself down a sort of a a cul-de-sac. Well, I think that's the paradox within this. We aim to teach something that we then tell people can't be taught. And I I would argue, 
If yeah. you want a description, uh, then Churchill from 1937 and his book on his own ancestor, Marlborough, is perfect. And this is actually from a monograph written by a retired field marshal, Carver, very good monograph. Mm. Um, that's actually on Montgomery, and we could come back to him as well if you want historic examples. And Churchill wrote, War's highest solution must be evolved from the eye and brain and soul of a single man. Then goes on to dismiss the efforts of almost any intelligent scribe who can draw up a lucid and logical treatise full of laboriously ascertained facts and technical phrases on a particular war situation. And goes on to conclude that nothing but genius, the demon in man, can answer the riddles of war and genius that it may be armed, cannot be acquired either by reading or by experience. So we're doing both. We're trying to educate and train people to be generals, but then we're saying, but unless you can demonstrate, you have that irrational tenth that mm. we'll never be able to test in peacetime. We will just sense, we will intuit you have it. You will give off the aura that you own it. Then, yes, I think you're right. We're rather failing people in that regard. And I, I suppose to move the conversation on, the point of my argument is, what sort of behavior does it encourage if we tell people there's no point in you even thinking about this unless you can demonstrate to us that you're not just a jobbing artist, but you are in fact Picasso? But then I this brings me back to one of the sort of fundamental contradictions I always felt joining the civil service, and I think the army would be the same, is that certainly in my case, I think the suggestion is that you are being recruited because you have a unique set of skills and perspectives. And this brings us on very clearly to the diversity question as well, is that we want we want challenge. We want everybody who joins to come at things from a different angle to enable us not only to understand the problem as well as we can, but to come up with as many possible solutions, including really creative ones. And then the first thing that happens to you, and I, I think it could be said that this happens in multiple private sector enterprises as well, is you go through a substantial training course where you're taught that there are clearly wrong answers and you're often taught that there is only a defined set of right answers. So in order to be a high performer coming out at the end of a training system, you have to have learnt the orthodoxy. And the challenge for anybody who's joining an organization is to progress through that sort of forming, shaping period of being a trainee in that organization and to emerge still with sufficient of your character intact that you are able to, within a system, prosper while also maintaining divergent views and articulating in such a way that you don't get sacked uh, for um, just being disruptive. And I think the military is a really good example of that paradox, because exactly what you're saying, Ed, is you're, you're teaching everybody that what you want is a whole room full of geniuses, but clearly a room full of geniuses, they're not going to pass the exams if they just all behave like that. So that's one problem. And when I was thinking about military genius just now, I was trying to break it down into, into sort of what that would entail on a battlefield. And I get the instinctive point, but the examples that I always, well, they always come to mind, but I'm not a military expert, so they're examples that are given to me, are often about tactical brilliance. It's deciding to do this rather than that, that will surprise or outwit or outflank the enemy in some way. And then another sort of subset of that is courage. So being bold about doing something, possibly even if it's idiotic, and then just having, as Ali said, the good luck for it to come off. And I wondered if I mean, there might be a whole load of other things in the list that would be the subsets of what you would call the idea of military genius that would probably be quite good to, to pull out. Because I'm just thinking now, obviously, of President Zelensky, who many would say is a good modern example of a heroic leader in the in the sort of broadest and least unpacked way. But what actually are we talking about in terms of visible, sort of demonstrable things that a heroic leader would do? Oh, there is so much in that. Should we mm. come back afterwards to the, the first point you made about teaching and when you go through training? Yeah. Because I'll just for now say, wonderful paradox, isn't it, that at staff colleges, and I did try and change this as DG Defence Academy, we say we want genius and brilliance, and yet we mark against some very tightly scripted answers, which are known yeah. as the pinks, because they're printed on pink paper. And he yeah. who gets close, and it was always used to be a he, who gets closest to, to the pink wins. 
Yeah. It was always a way of corralling groupthink. But your second uh, question is, I think, massively interesting because I, if we go back through history, and I was just doing some work this weekend, head of a similar thing, but looking at one particular leader I've always championed, uh, Chief Marshal Tedder, when you read around him, what he himself did, wrote, and what others thought, especially you know, especially Churchill, you found Churchill tried to sack him twice, essentially because he wasn't heroic enough. And the courage there was the moral courage to write to Churchill and say, these numbers are flawed. This is what it's really like out here and set realistic expectations. But also to understand the wider context of the war. So leadership in war is not the same as that tactical brilliance on the battlefield, which you mentioned. So I think part of the problem here is we confuse that leadership on the battlefield and you'll still find members of the British military who lionize some of the great operational tactical commanders, uh, German commanders, the von Mansteins of the Second World War for their quickness and agility in the counterattack, at, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Except it didn't add up to a heap of beans. Go back to the US Civil War mm. and the military experts will lionize the generals of the Confederacy because of their brilliance as battlefield commanders. But they lost the war. So I think... A lot of the courage here is the ability to see the bigger picture and tell truth to power. So to finish on this and ha you know, hand back, you mentioned Zelensky. I don't know because I don't know what he's doing behind the scenes. But what you can see is he's setting realistic expectations, even though clearly he's managing a wonderful information operation, not least you know, against us, if you like, to keep us on side. But you probably have heard of Zeluzny, though he's quite low key. He just talks in quite a technocratic way about the management of the Ukrainian armed forces. But can you name off the top of your head any of the battlefield commanders in the Ukrainian armed forces at the moment? Think, though, about how many of the general Armageddons that the Russians have put forward that you can name and their World Wrestling Federation uh, <laughs> nicknames that go with them, as in General Armageddon, which is, once again, the cult of the heroic strongman leader. So... I don't think we have adequately answered your question. Hmm. And I think I will say, I think in peacetime, though we like to talk strategy, what we're really preferring and privileging is people who look like they can demonstrate chutzpah on the battlefield. But our history tells us that those generals don't always form part of the winning side. I mean, I was I was thinking just to go back on this, that you know, part of what we're talking about in terms of heroic leadership is the, is the ability to motivate and to... You know, to raise morale and put things, and that, I suppose that's the way that Zelensky comes forward because we don't see Zelensky as a battlefield commander or a necessarily a great strategist. I mean, I don't know, as you know, I mean, we don't know what he's he's doing on a, on a direct, you know, on a immediate military level, rather than say the broader aspect of mobilizing opinion and keeping spirits alive, which would be, I suppose, in echoes of, as they say, you know, the sort of Churchillian mode of keeping things going. Although. I mean, I'm struck by, you know, the comments that are ascribed to Churchill there and the quotes that you were saying. Of course, Churchill was notorious for sort of intervening in sort of all sorts of aspects of military strategy, which is, you know, Alan Brook and others were very irritated about because he constantly wanted to sort of show that he knew things in a sense or he could provide things. You know, one of the things that I think is, is quite interesting is that, you know, if you go back to this sort of notion of, you know, our modern heroic leadership in terms of a Napoleonic leadership and people trying to replicate that sort of Napoleonic genius, if I can put it that way, of course, you know, Napoleon is on record really for saying that actually, if you want to be good at war, you need to read the master of the past and you need to sort of get and educate. In a curious sort of way, the sort of genius that people are trying to capture and bottle up in a sense and replicate is actually really, in a Napoleonic sense, actually the ability to sort of understand the data, read the data and apply the data. I mean, that's basically what he's doing. And when you look at it, you know, there's this wonderful study of probably his most successful grand campaign in the sense of the defeat of Prussia in 1806, where he actually comments that he has no idea what the Prussians are doing because they're not following any of the rules. You know, they're actually turning up at the wrong place. I mean, <laughs> in the sense that he had sort of organized the entire campaign on the basis that the Prussian high command would be, quote, rational, and they just weren't. And that's why, in a sense, the whole, in terms of battlefield experience, went all wrong in some ways for Napoleon, because they, the Prussians didn't react as he expected them to. That didn't mean, ultimately, of course, that they were completely obliterated, and that's, you know, the campaign was a complete disaster for them. But it's quite striking that even that 
you know, for me, that sort of idea of, quote, the genius in inverted commas, in a sense, what Napoleon is doing in that campaign is following the rules as he understood it, you know, a very orthodox approach, but applied with a great amount of energy, if I can put it that way. I mean, that's the genius rather than, you know, uh, I mean, if you, if you were to go back to your other example of Hannibal at Cannae, I mean, it really depends on your opponent being a complete idiot to be able to get away with something like that. I mean, do you, do you know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, Hannibal gets away with Cannae because the Roman command is so pedestrian. I mean, it is so pedestrian. It can't adapt at all. It goes through this sort of rigmarole and basically they walk into the trap and that's it. And they have no way of extricating themselves. So most of these very decisive victories rely on the other side being so woeful. I mean, that it's, you know, so I don't know where the genius is, you know, in, in, in a sense, you've got to depend on the other side being really, really bad. And obviously hindsight helps, doesn't it? I mean, you're a genius because it worked. I mean, if, if your brilliant idea didn't work, then you're not going to be, a, you're not going to be recorded as a genius. No, I think that last point is absolutely key. And to link yeah. it to what you said about, um, you know, Napoleon, of course, you know, it's the time of the levee en masse. Yeah. He is the first to realise that his troops can be march separately, which is logistically more sustainable mm -hmm. because they are sweeping over and then concentrate force, which requires things to be done quickly. And you talked about communication and, uh, you know, and, and other elements. So actually, the genius, as so often is the case, is in one of organization, not in the things we think where the genius is. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's just one, just one example. One of aspect of it. Yeah. Um, but it's a very, very important one. We could talk about things that are going wrong today in British military. So I think I have over the weekend in the Sunday Telegraph on an article related to this. But those commanders don't want to be known as people who just smelt the, the coffee of the, the way society was changing, because warfare always follows a socioeconomic change. They've capitalised on it. They'd rather be seen as heroic battlefield commanders. And actually, that probably plays well to your troops. So there's an element here of almost creating a persona so that the troops will get behind the cult of the winning general. And it therefore helps if you can paint yourself as invincible, because that's a little bit more comforting than saying, actually, I've got a pretty good organizational structure and I've realized what the possibilities of today are, and we're going to be organized and, and do things slightly better. And that is exactly where Ted was, where, where I, I picked him before during the Second World War. I'd say Churchill tried to get rid of him twice even though he's massively successful, working really well and usually respected by our allies, Churchill virtually says, he's, he's, I think he called him a nuts and bolts man and, and tried to, you know, various occasions, on the second occasion, as Eisenhower's much respected deputy replaced him with General Alexander, who Churchill had a thing for because he was, he was Churchill's idea of the romantic heroic general. And fascinating when you read around what Tedder was looking at at the time, and I was reading the much respected war diaries of a man who essentially did my job 70 years before uh, major general kennedy jack kennedy who was director of operations in the in the war office during the second world war who's complaining about some of tedder's plans because and these were the transport plans this was essentially ruining the the rail network for germany saying but they only need 20% of the railway to work and they can still move all the troops around so even the planners in the MOD could only see this in terms of battlefield fighting what Tedder and he used scientists on his Zuckerman what they mm -hmm. had done and worked out is you're actually fighting an economy it is the German economy and as the German economy has had to completely diversify its economic effort to protect it from the bombing so you need to build engine factories and hills with slave labor and hillsides in Silesia, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, to bring all that back together, you've still got to bring it above ground and put it on the railway. So even as the graphs now show, Tedder's plans are shrinking the German war economy such that it can no longer fight, our own side is essentially still only seeing this in those heroic battlefield terms of, well, is it allowing the, the Wehrmacht to get around France more quickly? And so this is my point about if you step back from that question of being heroic on the battlefield and start to look, and you mentioned Napoleon and data and understood what was going on. It's that ability in a very clear way to do the critical thinking about what success really involves. And often that cuts across the desire to do something dashing and swashbuckling in the moment. And it is the difference between long-term steady and deliverable strategy and having your picture painted on Marengo as you cross the Alps. <laughs> You know. This is interesting because so many things 
so many themes of earlier discussions that we've had cross over here, and particularly one that Ali and I talk about a lot, which is the importance of really understanding what's going on. And that's why your example about the German economy is so good, because you can only actually be a proper creative genius Mm. if you really understand how things work and what drives the choices that people are going to take in any given situation. And of course, then you have this really complicated thing in a power structure about who actually understands the minute detail necessary to be you know, real insight into what levers you might be able to pull to make something happen differently. And over the course of the last year and a half, we've all learned a lot more about stuff that we should have known about Russian calculations in why they want the Crimea and water supplies and rail networks and bridges and things like that, which obviously are, are something the Ukrainians know off by heart, but we don't. And one of the things that struck me again and again, actually reflecting on Afghanistan, is that although the fall of Kabul was rapid and the speed was a surprise, the fact of it was not a surprise. And and the group of people to whom it was probably least surprising were junior British troops who'd been on the ground for the preceding years, who knew clearly the way that the tide was flowing and who thought that they were speaking upwards but actually, there's somewhere, there's a blockage somewhere in the system, which means that I think, Ed, I know that you feel this quite strongly, that it's, that it's, it's very difficult to say, I don't think this is working. I think there's a whole set of other things we need to think about. And one of the lessons I learned, especially as the world becomes so technical so quickly, is that often the most junior person in the room is the one who really knows what's going on. So you have this inverted wisdom pyramid, something I lecture about when I'm talking about crises, that you need to create a space where the most junior person in the room says, but actually, this is what I'm seeing. And you can't fathom out how I've drawn this conclusion because you can't work the piece of kit or because you know I'm the one who's on the ground patrolling all the time. But, but that piece of information has the potential to enable the genius leader to be a genius leader. And the point I'm making, I suppose, is is there a special characteristic of a heroic leader, which is that you have to be able to create that space to hear from the yeah. people who really understand. Yes, and that's another one of those courage areas. And and just to reinforce what you've just said, I now understand, and I probably didn't fully at the time, why when I did the High Command and Staff course in 06, one of the opening lectures on intelligence and intelligence provision was given by the then Chief of Defence Intelligence, uh, Lieutenant General Andrew Ridgway. But he entitled it, I am my own intelligence officer. And it was a bit odd because I you know, come from a background and run some military operations at a tactical level in the Air Force. And we had a squadron intelligence officer and he was wondering what's he getting at? And what he was getting at was the fact that throughout his career, he'd seen several headquarters where the genius general doesn't need an intelligence officer because to have an intelligence officer would be admit that you aren't yourself seeing through the fog of war. And I have examples, which I will not use here, of where intelligence reports from Afghanistan over the years were amended to fit preferred narratives or there were attempts at amendment. And when you try and get to ground truth, and I don't know whether you've ever had a chap called Keith Deere on your podcasts. If not, there will be something. No, but we will. We'll invite Keith on. Brilliant young man. And I met him as a very young intelligence officer, frustrated and working in an intelligence office on Kandahar Airfield and came and asked me for a job because he just wasn't being over seven different intelligence operations, about nine different Met offices as well on Kandahar. And I can tell you what the Met in Afghanistan is like in the summer. It doesn't need one Met office. <laughs> so, um and he, what he wanted to do was go out and do polling, which we did in places like Aruzgan, uh, not just Helmand where, where we were. We wanted to do polling into what is the effect of coalition operations on the psyche of that population that we were talking about. And it was our sense that if you live in a compound in rural Afghanistan and a helicopter gunship flies overhead, you're missing the nuance that that might be a British or American one and not a Soviet hind one. And especially if it starts firing every now and again, because it's a bit worried about something. And we just did, wanted to find out how air power and other things were construed. And I think that data we produced was very useful, but it wasn't very welcome at the time. 
because there were a bunch of sort of preconceived ideas about how Hellman was going, how it should be shaped, how it should be understood, which you know, we, we, which we could unpack. But of course, the other thing, which I think now is one of these great known secrets, but unvoiced, you know, everybody would now believe this, but you won't see it written down in too many places, is of course the structure of our command arrangements in Hellman changed everything over every six months. And we had a heroic leader in charge every six months. And it was well known. You know, if you had a good war, you were a good brigadier running Brit force in Helmand. Chances were you'd be in the running to be GOC 3 div or if not 1 div afterwards. And so you're incentivized to be heroic. Um, and maybe at that point, scruffy, quite junior um, Air Force type saying, hold on, have you looked at this? Might this have a bearing? Is not necessarily welcome at the time. So I think all in, in, in those examples, I think there's support for the points you made. But, I mean, what you seem to be saying, Ed, here is that, I mean, what you seem to be describing here is the very contradiction of heroic leadership, though. Is it not? I mean, what, what you're saying is someone who thinks that they're sort of like, have a certain superior understanding, but actually isn't really paying attention to what's, yes. what's going on around. I mean, to go back to one of the historical examples you were talking about, T.E. Lawrence. Uh, so T. Lawrence is seen as, in some ways, as the epitome, well, if not the epitome, but certainly a good example of a romantic, heroic leadership, someone who galvanizes, obviously, the Arab revolt and uh, applies a, a different style of warfare, certainly a sort of guerrilla warfare, and that develops that. But, you know, T. Lawrence was precisely heroic because he probably did listen and reflect and pick up things from the ground. I mean, in a sense, mm. you know, from what you're saying is, you, you know, we are fostering a culture of, uh, I don't know how you would describe it, but sort of faux heroic leadership, if I can put it that way. I don't know if that's right. I mean, am I... Am I- no, I've used that phrase. I'm more prosaic and Anglo-Saxonized as false heroic is a phrase I've, is a phrase I've used. And, and, um, right. Um, to prove to Suzanne I can be sensitive to these things, I sort of dropped it on the grounds that it, it would probably just offend people b- before the off. But I think the way to think about this is it can become performative. Yeah. Uh, and so you take, you absorb what you think of as the traits of a heroic leadership, but you then project those. And in exercise scenarios and other things in peacetime, this tends to be with you know, fl- flamboyance. Exercises are short. They're quite limited. How, how, how do you put yourself across? So, yes, there is a... There is a sense you take the the performative aspects of, as we've already said, is there a more romantic military leader than than, than Lawrence? And you take the overt uh, persona that everyone thinks they know, and you start to mimic that a little bit. So uh, all of us involved in Afghanistan, we all went and read the books. Of course, we said that we knew it and that we understood Mm. it. But but did we really? And how much of that was swaddling ourselves in the clothes, the robes of the, you know, yeah. the, ro- the robes of Lawrence, rather than taking a step back and saying, this is all about the Afghan government. Why do we have a Hellman roadmap when it's only one of 32 provinces? It really ought to slot in with what both ISAF and the government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan are doing. And we should stop trying to run a sort of Brit-only uh, operation here, despite the fact how, how much more stimulating and challenging that, that would be for us. That's just another way of thinking about it. But the heroic tends to make you want to charge in at the four i'm going to show you how this should be done i've got six months to make my mark and you're right you're aping certain uh, apparent qualities rather than necessarily understanding what the attributes were that were in it. so if i was to draw a parallel which will probably offend a lot of people so suzanne's probably a bit anxious at this moment but if i was to draw a parallel is it a bit like the french high command prior to the first world war that got completely captivated by the notion of the offense and basically spend six months getting completely obliterated before they start changing and realizing that the situation is is somewhat different. I mean, it's this idea that a certain doctrine of heroic leadership dominates thinking to such an extent that it just doesn't match the reality on the ground. Well, I'd shade that slightly. I I think in preparing for this and making sure of my lines, as it were, I I went and found some of the the latest PowerPoints used still within Elements of the Defence Academy on this. Uh, they haven't changed much since I was <laughs> received them as a student in 06. But there's an emphasis in there, to use your word, on doctrine. Right. And so you end up, once again, another paradox, as we keep coming back to this, because there's, on one hand, we're heroic and flashes of brilliance. On the other, we really emphasize doctrine. And it's, it differs across the three services. 
but some are absolutely beholden to the doctrine. And I've seen that on real campaigns, at which point your faux heroic leadership becomes standing at the front of the troops, metaphorically, whether you're in the lead tornado on night one of Gulf War One, or whether you're in the first tank across the the, um, the berms or whether you are arriving in Lashkagar, you are going to display what looks like heroic leadership. But actually behind the scenes, you may be pursuing a doctrine because that's what you've been steeped in all your life, which is no longer applicable. And no one ever said that doctrine was something you had to follow. It's the best guess in peacetime. So yes, there is a paradox here. And we could almost encourage people to learn how to become faux heroic leaders and hope to carry on generating that impression of themselves in peacetime, where maybe we should be teaching something else, something a bit more reflective. I, so I'm going to try and make the case for genius heroic leadership, because we've just been sort of bashing it for ages. And yet, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in surprise as essentially something we should be more confident about doing. And you could argue that the way that we've developed our bureaucratic world, and by that I also include all the sort of legal parameters that that bind us in our daily lives, and the agreement that we have in these democratic islands that we will take decisions by consensus. And actually, I think you can bring artificial intelligence in here as well, and sort of the suggestion that essentially you can take all known examples and run the term an algorithm and produce a better example or a perfect example in some way. All of those are driving us towards uh, possibly unexciting thinking, conformity, conformity to the law, conformity to, to our processes and our expectations, all of which make it really hard to be the one who says, I think we should do this unexpected thing. I think we should act first. I think we should. I mean, I'm thinking of Ali's example of Napoleon and, and the, the Prussians. You know, I think we should. They'll be expecting us to do this. I think we should do that. And it's always very difficult to build the evidence case for why that is a good idea because we are essentially saying we should take a punt. But isn't it often the case that the great breakthroughs come? not when you do what's expected, but when you do what's unexpected. So that's my case for allowing, creating space in a system for the genius. And I suppose the challenge is then to identify who the genius is, <laughs> because because if it's someone with brilliant judgment and a great idea, it'll yeah. work. I just step it. I mean, just to add to what you're saying, I mean, I suppose it depends on how you're defining the concept of genius, because obviously someone who can absorb the data, read the terrain, whatever, we'll be able to do things differently to the orthodox. But in some ways, what I see, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Ed, but it, in the sense of what you're saying is that, I mean, what was that quote you said at the beginning? It's that, that the irrational 10%. Irrational 10th. Yeah, irrational 10th. Whereas in a sense, what you've been describing, Suzanne, is, is really the ability of someone to do the calculations fast enough, in a sense, to process the data, the terrain, whatever, to be able to take actions that are out of the ordinary or to see that certain things are possible. Whereas there's almost like a, a highly romanticized view of heroic leadership, which is actually, it's not that, ten, but you know, it's the sort of thing that I, you're right, Churchill would like, because Churchill talks about this. I mean, he is a great romantic in that sort of sense. But from what I, what I understand what you're saying, Ed, is that actually it's completely impractical in many ways. It, it's not something that really works. And actually, even worse than that, it's not that it doesn't really, really work. It actually facilitates or enables error. Yes. Um, your points and, and, and Suzanne's before that are, are actually very well made. And I think you have you know, thrown out what will always be contested, which is where is the scope for surprise and doing mm. something genuinely different? And that's why I say the paradox you have at the moment is a lot of military education is to ram doctrine down people, but then say, but show your your genius. Show how well. different you are. Yeah. yeah and I think my, my, my problem with this, as I say, is it throws so much onto the shoulders of the general to be both the one that cuts through and sees, therefore senses the opportunity, has the flash of brilliance, and then has the energy to... Now, if you want a, uh, a little bit of heroic brilliance, I'll give you a lieutenant colonel in Andover in 2003 
who's a loggy, probably therefore not on the fast track to the higher command and staff course of his more When you say loggy, you mean logistics? Present. Is that what you mean? A lo- logistician, sorry. Logistician, yeah, yeah. Into, yeah, into, yeah. Into the, in, thank you, the jargon there. Now, his particular act of brilliance was when we realised we may have to ship a large force out to the Gulf in 2003, he realised that if he asked for X, I was going to use another jargon term, limbs, but essentially X amount of space on commercial shipping that we would actually need, that would distort the market and therefore the price would go massively up. But he also knew, so back to your point, specialist knowledge, expertise, understanding uh, what's really going on to a deep level. He also knew that if he apply, if he just asked for why, then a certain number of people would bid for that. And if he bought them all, he'd end up with X. Mm. But he never revealed to the market that the Brits were looking for essentially 40, 50 ships worth of capacity. Now, that to me is an act of genuine brilliance at quite a low level that actually saved us a fortune, probably enabled the operation. Now, the commander above will have signed that off, but the actual act of the flash of brilliance will have come from below. So even in a deeply technical world like that, you can have flashes of brilliance, but they actually come from people who have a deep understanding of what they're dealing with. And so I come back to, and I'm going to link it to what you're talking about with, you know, with AI, I was just fascinated that Someone like Tedder used Solly Zuckerman, uh, you know, a brilliant scientist, to understand what the impact was of the military operations and how this was going to defeat Germany as a socio-economy, not just facilitate better success on the battlefield. But it does come back to having to know and understand. You talked about data. The data in this case was held in Antwerp or Brussels, can't remember where finding all of Deutsche Bahn's very detailed German records about the performance of the railway system throughout the war and realising what they were doing. And they mentioned AI. Well, you can learn a heck of a lot now if you can crunch through the sort of data that we could never have looked at before. So I will posit, going back to one mm. of the examples you used earlier about the French in 1940, if they could have known, uh, and they could have done, exactly what the Wehrmacht was training for, where it was investing its money and found out that it wasn't really doing much training or investing much money in equipment that could breach the Maginot line, you wouldn't have put your faith in it. Now, at the moment, we know that we can work out exactly what, say, China is doing in Xinjiang, the number of concentration camps it's building, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because actually there are, as with Germany, very detailed bureaucratic records of the money that's been spent, the things that have been built. We just don't have 50 hangers worth of Mandarin speakers who can read all those documents at the moment and then talk to each other to find the cross-reference points and then write a comprehensive detailed report. But AI will allow, machine learning will allow you to do that. We can now. Yeah, that's it. I mean, so sort of the the 99% sweat behind the sort of genius move Some of that heavy lifting can be done by AI, basically, is what you're saying. So here's a question then. So if we could throw in, um, bouncing all over the show, forgive me, but Mm. um, there are hooks here people can look at, but look at the world of chess. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert here, but reading around it, I think what shocked the world of chess, or even those that play Go, was not the fact that things like Deep Minds in Go, uh, Alpha Go, and then Alpha Zero, or even some some of the better chess computers, could play chess really well. It's that, I think it's called Move 37. Suddenly the computer did something that no grandmaster had even thought of before or done. Now, what happens now when your military commander is presented with something that goes against his natural genius and flair to do, but suddenly there's some advice that, hey, you might want to think about this a different way. How is that going to be contextualized? How are you, how are you going to, because it cuts against that whole sense that you've been trained that you are the genius. You're the one that can see through. Now you're going to have to go down to that low level and sit down with your data scientists and with your people who understand quite how all this will have been derived and say, well, what can we know? How much risk is involved in listening to this? These are, I think these are a diff- not just a different skill set, but I think it's going to require a slight change in command personas and personality and away from the bags of energy, I'm ahead of anybody else, I'm, I've got that, I'm my own intelligence officer and I'm going to show you a flash of brilliance in a minute. And it's going to be much more like quite a few of those Second World War leaders, the Eisenhowers and the others, where the leadership was a lot more reflective and you had to defer to some of your experts beneath you. 
So my point is not that, as I said, there are no black and whites in this. Mm. I could have made this case probably at any time in the past. The reason I'm making it now is I think the way that our understanding of what we can know, and Suzanne has talked a lot, quite rightly, uh, about analysis and about appreciation and about detailed understanding of your environment, that's going to change and in ways that go beyond just do I trust what my intelligence officer is telling me or not. And I'm going to suggest that the way we build up our commanders to cut through all that and make a quick decision, because you can never know stuff anyway, and my intuition will give me and therefore you the right answer, that won't allow us to adopt the possibilities of the future as readily as we might if we also thought about the leadership style required to make the best use of it. Well, on that note, Ed, I'm going to wrap this up for this session, but I'm going to suggest that we might, uh, well, if you're willing, actually, is get you back at some stage to continue this conversation, because I think there's a rich vein of uh, of discussion to be had on this. And I think it is very relevant, actually, to, you know, as you said, how we're, how we're going forward. So I wanted to sort of thank you for, first of all, taking the time to come and talk to Suzanne and myself. But hopefully we will have whetted your appetite for a further discussion of this as we go forward. So thanks once again. That's really all from me and Suzanne on this episode of On Geopolitics. And we look forward to catching up with you on our next episode, which will be out shortly. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.